Saving Private Ryan is a tribute to the American soldiers of World War II, and the filmmakers took great pains in preparing the film for screen. Here are some of the historical and technical details that went into making the cinematic masterpiece. Saving Private Ryan is celebrated for its unmatched authenticity, but it may surprise you to know that the film is ultimately a work of fiction. Written by Robert Rodat, the film draws inspiration but is only loosely based on the true story of the Nyland brothers, Edward, Preston, Robert, and Frederick. The four were sons of Agnes Allison of Port Carbon, Pennsylvania, and a monument was erected in their honor. Preston and Robert were killed in combat a day apart in June of 1944, and it was believed that the eldest brother Edward had also perished but was later found to be a POW in Rangoon. Youngest brother Frederick took part in the early days of the Normandy invasion before receiving the news of his brother Robert's death. He was ultimately shipped back to New York, where he served as an MP until the end of the war. He was awarded a Bronze Star. The film opens with one of the most arresting battle sequences ever to be put on film, the storming of Omaha Beach. The battle was shot with such uncompromising accuracy that the Department of Veteran Affairs set up a telephone hotline for traumatized veterans to help them cope with reliving what they experienced firsthand. Before the battle at Omaha Beach, Saving Private Ryan opens with a veteran and his family at the Normandy American Cemetery and Memorial in Colleville-sur-Mer in Normandy. We aren't given his name and audiences can only guess at his identity until the very end of the film, but the filmmakers actually give us a little help. Take a look at the pin on his jacket. It's a 101st Airborne Division pin, which is a very specific clue. To prepare his ensemble cast for their roles as soldiers, director Steven Spielberg set them on a grueling week-long course at boot camp instructed by technical advisor Dale Dye. Having worked with Dye in preparation for his war sequences in another movie, Forrest Gump, Tom Hanks, who plays Captain Miller, knew what was in store. The rest of his company, however, did not. According to Hanks, the other guys were expecting something like camping in the woods and maybe learning things while sitting around the campfire. This was obviously not the case. As the boot camp proved so intense, the rest of the ensemble voted to quit. Of course, their votes didn't hold water, as their captain, Hanks, voted to stay and complete the training. However, there was one big name who didn't have to take part in the training. Matt Damon plays the titular character Private James Francis Ryan. The soldier Hanks and company are ordered to secure and bring home. Unlike the rest of the ensemble, Damon didn't have to go through the grueling boot camp. In fact, Spielberg forbade him from participating in order to strengthen the rest of the cast's resentment toward his character. And that's not the only little-known detail about his casting. During preparation for Saving Private Ryan, Spielberg wanted to cast an unknown actor with an all-American look for Private Ryan. Enter the relatively unknown at the time, Matt Damon. Of course, Spielberg had no way of knowing that Damon would win an Oscar for Goodwill Hunting that year and become an overnight star before Saving Private Ryan was even released. Still, Damon's identity was deliberately kept from audiences until later in the movie. Take a look at the scene where Mrs. Ryan is given the horrible news about her sons. Inside the doorway on the right is a photo frame of all the Ryan brothers. However, James's face is mostly covered by a small American flag. By not sharing his identity with the audience, Spielberg puts us in the same position as Captain Miller and company, trying to find a needle in a stack of needles. If it's precision you're interested in, look no further than Private Daniel Jackson of West Fork, Tennessee, played with unwavering tenacity by Barry Pepper. Much thought and detail went into developing the character of this left-handed sniper. For instance, take a look at his right thumb. Do you see the bruise under his nail? This was a common injury for soldiers in World War II because soldiers would regularly get their thumbs caught in the loading mechanism of M1 Garands. Another authentic detail can be found in Jackson's choice of scopes. In the movie, Jackson uses two, a Uredi 8 power scope on the left and an M73 B 2.5 mag scope on the right. Jackson swaps between them regularly, and over time this results in his Uredi 8 power being unzeroed, which causes Jackson to miss shots more often later on. Here's one more interesting fact about Private Jackson. In the scene where Captain Miller blindfolds the German prisoner, pay close attention to Private Jackson. Do you see the way he ties his rifle sling around his arm? This is a rifleman technique marksmen use to keep a steady aim. Jackson's preparing to execute the prisoner, based on Captain Miller's actions. Watch his confused reaction once Miller says they're letting the prisoner go. Not every soldier is so lucky. During the Omaha Beach sequence, we see a medic get hit in the canteen. Notice how the canteen loses water before the blood of the wound begins to seep out. Another bit of detail can be found in the sound design used for the battle sequence, particularly with regard to sniper fire. In Private Jackson's first sniper sequence, did you notice how his gun flares? You see the German sniper get shot, and then you hear the gunshot. This isn't an error. The filmmakers were paying close attention to the speed of sound and how it would play out in normal space. Here's another interesting fact about Jackson. 
In the battle scene in the French village, Jackson shoots a German sniper in the eye through his own rifle scope. This shot pays tribute to a Marine Corps sniper named Carlos Hathcock, who shot an enemy the same way in real life, a shot that snipers have tried and failed to make sense. After Captain Miller and his men make their way inland from Omaha Beach, they're met by two German soldiers who try to surrender. The soldiers weren't German but actually Czechoslovakian conscripts, which means they were forced into service by the German army. The Ost, meaning East, battalions were made up of mostly Czech and Polish war prisoners. If you translate their lines, what they're saying is basically, do not shoot, I am Czech. I did not shoot anyone, I am Czech. Without a proper interpreter in Miller's ranks during the battle, the two soldiers are tragically executed. Miller debriefs with Lt. Col. Anderson, played by Dennis Farina, who gives him the mission to find Private Ryan. Listen closely to Anderson's phone conversation as Miller approaches. He can be heard discussing getting tanks inland at Carrington. Just three years after the release of Saving Private Ryan, Steven Spielberg and Tom Hanks would join forces again to produce the groundbreaking World War II miniseries Band of Brothers. Episode 3 follows Easy Company in their fight in the Battle of Carrington. Sergeant Mike Horvath is played by Tom Sizemore, known for his intense work in movies like Point Break, Strange Days, and Heat. While his character was battling the German army, Sizemore was battling a war within himself during production. Aware of Sizemore's struggle with substance abuse, director Steven Spielberg tested the actor daily and gave him an ultimatum. If Sizemore failed the test just once, he would be fired. Spielberg made it clear he had no reservations about recasting and reshooting all of Horvath's scenes. Sizemore agreed and managed to pass all of his tests. Mission accomplished, and a harrowing performance. Harrowing does not begin to describe the entirety of Saving Private Ryan. The movie is filled with tension at every turn, not just for Captain Miller's men, but within the company as well. During one such scene after letting the German soldier go, Private First Class Richard Rybin, played by Edward Burns, threatens to go AWOL, absent without official leave. In turn, Sergeant Horvath threatens to shoot him. To defuse the tension, Captain Miller decides to tell his unit what he does for a living back home, a secret the soldiers were betting money over. In the original script, Captain Miller gives a long speech to his men, but Tom Hanks felt it wasn't right for the character. He told Spielberg one fact was enough, and that it didn't fit with Miller's character that he would reveal any more background into his life back home. Spielberg agreed, and the speech was shortened. Part of what led to the company's internal fight is the loss of their medic, technician fourth grade Erwin Wade, played by Giovanni Rabisi. Wade is wounded while the team overtakes a German bunker. Pay attention as he requests a little more morphine. During World War II, morphine surrettes contained a very strong dose, and two for someone with blood loss as severe as this would be fatal. This fact is played out by the rest of the unit in their heartbreaking hesitation before giving him what he wants. Shortly after, just before Captain Miller orders the German prisoner to be blindfolded, watch him as he approaches the prisoner and Jeremy Davies, who plays technician 5th grade Timothy E. Upham. What he's doing is removing the trigger groups of the rifles and throwing them away, making the weapons useless to the prisoner or any German reinforcements who happen upon the site. Here's another example of the filmmaker's excellent attention to historical detail. In the ruins of the French village, do you see the graffiti on the wall? It reads Patin est un traite, which translates to Patin is a traitor. Philippe Patin served as a prime minister and marshal of Vichy, France, and was seen as a Nazi collaborator. Look closely at the Tiger tank during the bridge battle and how it has a strange rigid surface. That's because it's covered in zimmerant, a defensive putty-like substance that keeps magnetic tank mines from attaching to the vehicle. Miller and his soldiers were obviously expecting this, which is why they made sticky bombs in preparation for the battle. In the final stand at the bridge, Captain Miller's fate is sealed by a German soldier, the same soldier who stabbed Private Stanley Mellish, played by Adam Goldberg. The filmmakers make a bold statement with Captain Miller's death. When he's shot, it's treated without drama. As the audience, we watch it happen from a distance. Captain Miller falls, like so many other nameless soldiers in the movie, without fanfare or emotion. Though we're treated to the final moments of the battle from one of our hero's perspectives, and Miller gets his poignant final words. For that moment, we're reminded of the merciless indifference of war. Regardless of its traumatic content, Saving Private Ryan was praised by many veterans of World War II. One well-known veteran of the war, James Doohan, also congratulated Steven Spielberg on the film's authenticity. If his name isn't familiar to you, maybe his famous character Scotty is. Doohan played Lieutenant Commander Montgomery Scott in the TV and film series Star Trek. Doohan participated in the storming of Normandy on D-Day at Juneau Beach as part of the 3rd Canadian Infantry. He was wounded in the leg during the war and also lost the middle finger of his right hand, a wound he would hide from cameras while performing on screen. I hope you liked the video and found some fascinating new insights into Saving Private Ryan. 
Make sure you subscribe to Movie Logic for more daily movie facts, trivia, and Easter eggs. And to all you veterans out there, we sincerely thank you for your service.